Next question, please. Yes, thank you. It comes to the line of Laura Henning. Please ask a question. Thank you. Uh, yes, Laurel Henning from MLEX. I was just wondering, yeah. perhaps we could return to Denmark as we were talking about that example just a second ago. Um, in terms of re um, completing this transformation of a power system, would you be able to give a, a time period in that example of, in a cost-effective manner, how long that would take? And what is cost-effective? We were given percentages, but I was just wondering if you could put a... A number, to, a number to that, perhaps. And um, another point of clarification, if I may, on the uh, the wind, letting letting uh, resources do what they should. I would just, um, could you go back to that slide? I don't know, maybe, and just um, explain again what you meant about the wind production in in different yeah. <laughs> uh, times. Know know got you. Thank you. Um, yeah, maybe let me answer your, your second question first. Uh, for technical reasons, we can't uh, jump back that quickly to the slide. I think what you meant was the system-friendly design of wind turbines. Yes. Okay. So the idea here is the following. Currently, we are building wind turbines in many instances that catch wind whenever possible and make electricity from it. And sometimes there is so much electricity that we need to shut down these turbines. Now, it can be a good idea to build wind turbines that don't even convert wind to electricity when it's very windy, and therefore these are cheaper from an overall system perspective, and that's what we were showing, so that you spill wind directly and that you don't need to shut down a turbine when it's generating when electricity is not needed. So that's the, that's the second part of the question. The first part of the question regarding Denmark. I think Denmark is an excellent example how to use existing resources in a stable system and to accelerate the transformation by doing that. Denmark has retrofitted old coal plants in a way that they can provide flexibility, but it has also built district heating plants using natural gas that have electric boilers so they can actually absorb surplus wind production. So this is a very, very good example how you can accelerate the transformation uh, even in a, in a stable system. Now, to put percentages and numbers on that in an individual country is beyond the scope of the report, but I would like to recall the most important result that we have in the report, which is, in the long term, these costs are very moderate, 10 to 15 percent in our test system. <laughs> and, um, uh, of course, this uses today's technology costs. So as these get cheaper, fossil fuels more expensive, and carbon more expensive, the additional costs can be brought down to zero. Thanks very much, Simon. Next question, please. It comes from the line of David Sahai. Please ask your question. Hey, David Sahai here from the Business Week, Germany. Um, you've written in the press release that the share of renewable energy could be up to 30% or more worldwide with uh, little additional cost, costs. Uh, my question is, when do you expect such a share at the earliest? In, or, uh, in what period is it possible? The point is that we also wrote in our press release that there are three main requirements, and that is uh, deploying variable renewables in a system-friendly way using state-of-the-art technology, mm -hmm. improving the day-to-day -day operation of power systems at markets, and finally, of course, investing in additional flexible resources. And then, of course, the point is when will that, when will that be realized? That depends on the number of policy measures that have to be taken, and it depends on the number of investment measures to be taken. And, well, we all hope, of course, that the discussions within Europe will be helpful to achieve that goal in a few, in, 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 in limited amount of years. But don't ask me to put a number of years how and when this is going to be achieved. Okay. Um, and maybe to, to add to this, uh, what we say in the press release is it's possible to reach 30 percent and more cost effectively. Now, whether a government wants to do that or not, that's up to them. We're just showing that it's possible. Thank you. Thanks very much. Next question, please. It comes from the line of Felix von Gaia. Please ask your question. Uh, hello. Actually, that last point was interesting about uh, when it's possible for governments to reach 30% in case of whether they want to or not. Um, I'd like to ask about the um, financial incentives, because obviously we have things like 
uh, fossil fuel subsidy phase out and moving that to renewables as one option and the carbon pricing between a cap and trade and a carbon tax and we have feed in tariffs. I was wondering if there's any other um, investment uh, incentives that you've thought of that could actually incentivize the transformation. Well, what we have seen in, in, uh, in Brazil, for instance, is reverse auctioning. And that, of course, is another issue. And I would like to mention something else. It is an initiative that was announced by Citibank and 13 other banks a couple of weeks ago in Abu Dhabi, where they, uh, where they announced that they were going to have green bonds. And green bonds are going to be used, when in, their, in their view, are going to be used for projects in clean energy. It doesn't mean that the company itself has to be clean or green, but it has to be the case that the company is using that money for clean and green solutions. This is something that could also offer an opportunity to invest, to, to get the private market more involved in these kind of investments. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Next question, please. It comes from the line of Christian Rosalind. Your line is open. Uh, yes, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I noted the emphasis upon gas as one of the flexible options. In the United States, we already have a fairly high penetration of natural gas. I believe it's about a third nationally, and certain regions have stronger concentrations, like around 40% in New England. Um, is this currently sufficient to handle the flexibility needs, in your opinion? Well, that depends, of course, on the of how the situation is. I know that in New England, I was there last week, I was at MIT, that prices of gas are uh, fairly high. And I also know that there is a new plan to build a new plant, a gas-fired power plant, that has a special, a special requisite, namely that it has to bring down its CO2 emissions. And bringing down its CO2 emissions will see to it that it has a longer time for, for, for being in production. And otherwise, if it can't make that, well, then it has a problem. So I think it's not only about gas. It's not only about gas. Gas is just part of the answer. And I think what we need to see, that is we need to go into a cleaner, a cleaner, um, a cleaner electricity production situation where gas acts as a bridge fuel between now and what we will have in the future, pushing coal out of the market, as we fear about that. But at the same time, gas is not the ultimate solution for a clean energy situation, especially as long as there is not CCS being applied together with the gas fire power plant. I, I think what I'm asking is really about the technical aspect. Is okay. it sufficient to provide flexibility? Um, well, first of all, I'd like to make the point, if we look at that region of the U.S., it actually, uh, as a whole, does not have that high variable renewable energy penetration today. So if your question is, is, is that still good to go to higher penetrations from there, it's a clear yes. Now, is that only enabled by gas? No. no. Uh, you need a portfolio of flexibility options, for example, uh, a robust grid or a sufficiently robust grid, um, and you also need demand-side response, or it helps in some situations. And now, is that region of the U.S. a good example for demand-side response? Yes. If we look at PJM, PJM has one of the most sophisticated market designs, so that's the market region there, or the main market operator in this region. It has a very sophisticated market design that has been successful at incentivizing demand-side response. What we were saying is, when we look at power generation, Gas is a very good complement for variable renewables, but an electricity system is more than just power generation. Okay. Next question, please. As a reminder, it's star one if you wish to ask a question. And your next question comes from the line of Daniela Androli. Please ask your question. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Daniela Androli from ML Green Power uh, Zone. Uh, two questions, actually. Uh, one is about uh, um, state-of-the-art techniques uh, for forecasting. You mentioned uh, during pre your presentation, I was wondering uh, which tool do you consider state-of-the-art or in which country you have seen uh, um, uh, they developed uh, state-of-the-art uh, forecasting uh, technology. And the second is uh, about um, ancillary services. I mean, uh, in Italy, uh, the, the authority has uh, proposed that uh, um, renewable plants uh, should directly do ancillary services, like primary reserve, uh, second and tertiary reserve. So I was wondering if you already started this kind of possibility, 
uh, if with the, um, uh, with the new technologies uh, these renewable plants uh, could uh, provide to the grid and fuel services, and if it's uh, uh, worth uh, uh, as a, um, uh, installed uh, installed capacity uh, it hasn't built uh, has not built for providing this kind of services to the grid. If it's worth investing uh, in the installed capacity in, uh, for um, uh, letting do this kind of uh, flexible services to the grid, or it's be better to invest in more conventional uh, flexibility like grids or conventional generation to improve flexibility or whatever. Thank you. Um, okay, I'll, I'll be brief. These are quite technical aspects, but uh, first of all, forecasting. It makes a huge difference if you use forecasts or not. And not all systems use forecasts, so that gets you a huge step. No matter what forecast you use, which is currently commercially available, that already is a huge benefit. Now, once you've taken this step, you can further improve by using several forecasts and then combining them to create a more sophisticated version of what will happen in the future. Now, some countries are already doing this, and where you have high penetrations, such as in Spain, in Germany, and Denmark, it's important to do this. But for countries that are starting, use a forecast. It's, it's very important that you use a forecast, not exactly which one it is. Speaking about uh, system services, so to stabilize the grid, services that are needed to stabilize the grid, it's true, in most regions, wind and solar are not allowed to do this. Now, vertically integrated utilities are in a good position to do this, actually, if they dare to. And if you look at the um, utility in Colorado in the United States, they are using wind power to provide regulation reserves during windy nights. And what they find is that they regulate more accurately than many thermal power plants. So there, where we've actually allowed to do it, where we use the forecast to know how much wind we'll have, it's working out very well. And I think your last question was, is it cost effective to retrofit old wind plants that they can do this? Now, there's no general answer to this question, but what is clear is countries that are just starting now should make sure that these wind plants can be controlled so that they can reap the benefit of having these services. I believe we've run out of time for the afternoon uh, webinar, um, but if you have any additional questions or would like to schedule an interview, do not hesitate to send an email to iea-pressoffice at iea.org. Uh, just a reminder that the slides that were shown here today are posted on our website, www.iea.org, as is a press release and the executive summary. Finally, the power of transformation is now on sale at the IEA Bookshop, www.iea.org books. That concludes today's press conference. Thank you for listening in. Thank you for your participation.